I am now calling the uh, board meeting of the Cincinnati Hamilton County Library, Public Library. And we will be going into executive session, but first I think we want to welcome everyone and introduce the board members who are here. And then we can okay. do the, yeah. Do you ready? Do okay. Ms. Allen? Here. Ms. Conan? Here. Mr. Olson? Here. Ms. Redden? Here. Thank you. Okay. And now we can do that. I now need a motion that the board enter executive session under a high revised code 121.22G3 to confer our attorney concerning disputes involving the library regarding pending or imminent court action. Roll call vote. Yeah, I need a motion. motion. I'll make a motion. Second. Uh, Ms. Allen? Here. Yes. Uh, Ms. Conan? Yes. Mr. Olson? Here. Ms. Redden? Yes. Okay. We gotta be oh, <laughs> Okay. That felt so good. I need a motion that the board exit executive session. Motion. Second. Okay. Roll call. Ms. Allen? Yes. Mr. Harding? Here. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Conan? Yes. Mr. Yeah, Olson? Yes. Ms. Redden? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yes. The Board of Trustees of the Public Library of Cincinnati and Hamlin County, the Board, welcomes input in this in its deliberations. The Board further recognizes both the importance of public comment on issues before the Board and the ability of members of the community to express their views of, on matters of interest to the library. We do have a full public participation policy, which includes a general three-minute limit on comments. Please remember that public comments are for us to listen to you and your fellow community members, it is unlikely we will make any remarks immediately. We need a chance to reflect on your comments, research subjects, and of course to consider any relevant legal codes and issues. We will set an alarm and cease reading at three minutes. We ask commenters to be civil and those addressing the board are expected to observe a level of, a level of civility and decorum appropriate for a public meeting and refrain from vulgar, profane or harassing remarks. The president of the board or other presiding officer may terminate any presentation deemed not to adhere to these standards. And do we have any persons here who would like to make public comment? No, I don't see anyone at this time. All right. And first introduction of the first action item is the director's report. Thank you and uh, appreciate Judge Allen, who's our vice president and presiding over the meeting today. And before I begin my report, I also want to recognize Denise Gretchen, who's in the audience. Denise is the branch manager oh. of the Anderson. And you may recognize her. She was at the Price Hill branch. So she presented all the good things here at Anderson. I encourage everyone to look around Anderson and hey, say hello to Denise and her staff. Too. Denise, do you want to say anything to the board? Give us a shout out. Just say hi. Thank you for your <laughs> Thank you. All right. Appreciate that. Okay. So for my report today, I have a bit of a 2021 year in review. S despite our, the many challenges that were presented last year, it was another successful year for our library. We were recognized, again, as a five-star library in the Library Journal Index for the ninth year in a row. Woo-hoo. Yeah, this reflects success in national metrics for rating public libraries categorized according to budget and population served, including per capita circulation, program attendance, and internet use. For libraries with budgets of 30 million or more, we were the second rated library system in the country. I will tell you that Cuyahoga County up in Cleveland, I think was number one. I did tell Tracy Strobel, the director, that we would be coming for her. So <laughs> Tracy, if you're watching cable access, be aware. Okay. But did you say that's nationally, right? Yes. What does that say about Ohio? Uh, we have great libraries. Uh Yes. We're very literate. Yes. <laughs> yes. Number one, we have great libraries. You're right. That's yes. number one. Yes. <laughs> and and um, to give the opportunity to the state, and we'll talk about it here, the PLF, the state level funding here, is really stable and very helpful for us. It allows Ohio libraries across the board to excel. So thank you to our legislators for that. Um, and we will talk about them holding that stable again. Also, the Urban Library Council hosts 
uh, honored us as a top innovator this year, one of only 10 top innovators from more than 280 submissions. This award honors our Spent a Day with a Library Worker Initiative, a partner between our marketing, so Beth and her division, and Human Resources, Kyla and her division, that featured a wide variety of staff and raised awareness of all the different services our library provides to the community. The actual award did show up. They mailed it. Here it is. So we'll add it to our list. I know it's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, some other recognitions that we received this year include our library, led by the impressive work of the marketing team received the prestigious John Cotton Dana Library Public Relations Award. That national award recognizes an effective strategy to increase the library's visibility in the community. The dedication of our virtual information center was recognized by the National Customer Service Association with an honorable mention in the service team of the year category for their commitment to excellence in service. Our fiscal office continued their streak of recognition with another Auditor of State Award with distinction for excellence in record keeping. We received the Richard Goodman Strategic Planning Award, honorable mention for our pandemic efforts from the Association of Strategic Planning. And as we've mentioned before, but just to round it out, two of our staff members, Sandra Presley, who's the Senior Branch Manager of our Price Hill, and David Siders, the Civic Engagement Coordinator, were honored by the OLC at their annual recognition award. Sandra received that Emerging Leader Award and David the Outreach Award. Supporting students and young people, Last year, we were a great deal of demand for supporting young people. We responded in a number of ways, offered homework helpers available at almost 20 library locations to help kids in grades K through 8. We provided more than 13,000 sessions for home, from homework help now, including live online homework tutoring, and gave out over 500,000 meals and snacks to youth in partnership with UMC Food Ministry. As is our tradition, we again developed a very fantastic summer program with a focus on providing books for kids and teens and also snacks and meals. We distributed 22,000 books, uh, 23,000 take and make craft kits, and 34,000 activity books whose content was developed through a partnership with several other community organizations. You've heard an awful lot about this, but uh, when it comes to community health, our library locations were crucial destinations for residents seeking health services last year. In particular, there's hard to find COVID resources. Just over 100,000 free at-home test kits were distributed at our drive-through locations, including here at Anderson. So thank you to Denise and her staff nonstop, particularly in December. Uh, we supported 48 vaccine clinics where over 500 doses were provided to adults and youth in partnership with the Health Collaborative's Test and Protect initiative. We also responded to the nation's biggest blood supply shortage in a decade by hosting a second year of blood drives with Hawksworth. And so last year, according to Hawksworth, who does calculations, the 294 blood products that were collected saved about 882 lives. So that is significant as well. Removing barriers to service, in September, the library made permanent the pandemic air suspension of, live, of late fees. Fine monies accounted for less than 1% of our revenue. This combined with a significant amount of staff time dedicated to collecting and processing those payments and reports from staff that the change had already contributed to more positive interactions between customers and staff supported the decision. Eliminating late fines will reduce barriers to library resources for many who otherwise might be concerned about financial liability and thus not take advantage of everything we have to offer. So thanks to Brett and his team who did a great job of presenting that report to all of you. And thank you to the board for moving forward with that vote. With more than 4.5 million digital downloads, last year uh, we saw that evolving technology also removes barriers for many customers. Digital checkouts across the board were up 14%. And the pandemic era implementation of virtual programming continued to be embraced by many in the community, just over 91,000 attendees stopped by 2,700 virtual programs. Our development office, Stacy down there on the end, set a very high bar for success last year, including the 2021 Mary Esther and Lecture, developed, de delivered by Pulitzer Prize winning Doris Kearns Goodwin, whose enlightening and lively talk brought to life some of our most successful presidents during a time full of pandemic challenges Many in our community were particularly thankful last year for that opportunity. Special thanks to Dr. S and, uh, Dr. Peter and Sandy Stern and the Stern Lecture Committee as that generous donation and hard work really made that possible. The Library Foundation supported just over 3,000 in-person homework help sessions at select library locations with funding from the Charles H. Dater Foundation, PNC Charitable Trust, and provided several thousand books thanks to a grant from the Scripps Howard Foundation 
to support Spanish-speaking communities and youth. Now, on to diversity, equity, inclusion. In 2021, we hired our first diversity, equity, and inclusion culture director, Dr. Ashley Dees, who is with us here again yeah, today. Come on. Uh, yeah, yeah, Ashley. So I would just like to read a, <laughs> a little formal bio of Ashley, and then she will be our featured speaker today. Uh, so we'll take a break from my presentation, and I'll turn it over to Ashley. Ashley is the newest member of our senior leadership. She joined us in t November of 2021, a Bachelor of Arts in Marketing and Public Relations from Wright State, a Master of Social Work from University of Cincinnati, and a Doctorate in Clinical Social Work from the University of Southern California. Ashley is also an independently licensed social worker and holds level two certification in trauma response, care, and treatment. She has specialized training in gender and sexuality, diversity and inclusion in the workplace, empathy and bias, and LGBTQIA plus cultural competency. She brings 13 years of clinical social work experience, including five years of DEI work, both within a wide variety of agencies and institutions. She previously served at Children's Hospital Medical Center Social Service Division's DEI facilitator, leading the development of a comprehensive, diverse, and inclusive strategy involving recruitment, staff development, and improving patient outcomes. She is primarily responsible for successfully circumnavigating about the staff and administrative level while upholding our standard to bring about the most impactful cultural changes throughout the organization, specifically involving diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a Cincinnati native, Ashley reports growing up in the library and has a lot of enthusiasm and passion for the future of library and DEI efforts today. She's going to speak to us about the library's DEI work and her role in getting the organization through this exciting journey. Ashley, over to you. Man, follow that up, right? All right. So, um, hi again. I'm Ashley. Um, so recently, the Calibrated Lens uh, Read Assessment Final Report was completed and um, is ready to be released to all library staff. Um, that report is over a hundred and something odd pages, so instead of releasing the entire report, um, we will be sending out the executive summary. Um, along with the executive summary, we will be sending out an inf infographic highlighting uh, the key messages of the report. Um, there will also be a small blurb um, explaining some of the charts and graphs that are in the executive summary. A little confusing, um, even for people that were actively involved in um, getting the report finished. Um, so in, in response to that in communications, um, after the managers have an opportunity to review the report with the staff, um, there will be office hours scheduled with me to go over any questions, any concerns, and at that time we will also offer the opportunity to speak with me on an individual basis should someone not be comfortable speaking in that group uh, setting. And then additionally, I plan to schedule a tour of divisions. Um, I was on tour once, right, and then COVID interrupted me, but so I'm going back on tour. Um, get the t-shirts ready, and we'll do uh, specifically to discuss the implications of the report within those divisions. So I want people to have the opportunity to speak with me about, you know, what does this mean for my work looking for, uh, moving forward? Um, and then finally, myself and HR, we are beginning to iron out plans um, for staff development day, but also continued education. So what that's going to look like in terms of staff development and how, you know, we're going to move forward with that in terms of our training schedule. And there will be more details about that to come. So look forward to working with everybody. Yes, rock star. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you. There are more details in the HR report, but does anybody have any questions before I move to the remainder of my report? Okay, thanks again, Ashley. Moving on to the facility master plan, we continue to make progress on the master plan, the FMP, notably opening the renovated and expanded Price Hill, Deer Park, as well as refreshing Anderson. So everybody here, make sure you walk through and grow spec. Many more projects remain in construction, including Water Hills and Madisonville. Our main library renovation moved forward with the temporary closing of the South Building and Plaza. Nadine was there at the very cool closing ceremony, which right. um, even I teared up a little bit, you know, and the South Building's not going anywhere, but it's 
It just was a moment of recognizing all it's done. And we have all moved all of our services over into the North Building. Changes to the North Building Plaza designed uh, to open up that area to the street outside give a hint of what to expect when we reopen that redesigned South Plaza. Additionally, the library worked with Artworks to connect with artist Jen Lewin, who will create an illuminated sculpture for installation in the redesigned South Building Plaza. And so in just a minute, we'll have an in-depth uh, look at all that we've accomplished with the FMP in about five to six minutes. Um, we won't go too long, but I do have a short PowerPoint, and Den LaRasa down there in the end is going to join me. Um, we have other resources folks can look at, but we do want to just do a quick PowerPoint, um, and we will do that in just a minute. But I have a couple of other things. Just want to say thank you. As a rounding up for the year in review, just take a quick moment to offer my personal thanks to all of you, our trustees. I really owe a great deal of thanks to 2021 Board President Diane Cunningham Redden, who continued the yes, tradition yeah. from 2020 of calls whenever and answering and talking through things for all of that support and assistance during another year full of unexpected challenges and opportunities. I also want to again thank um, Mrs. Lamakia, who's not here. She attended her final board meeting as a trustee this fall after dutifully and wonderfully serving on the board for more than 20 years. Wow. My appreciation to our amazing supportive community, and there are no words to describe my appreciation for our staff members who have persevered during this time other than to say thank you all. We all know that public libraries have been a lifeline for many during these difficult times, and in 2021, the distribution of those rapid test kits at the drive through windows demonstrated this reality like never before. Staff, you may never know how the full impact of the service you have provided. It has been remarkable. So thank you, and if we can do a quick Round of applause yeah. for all of those folks. Quite, quite notable. Um, and I do want to just pull out one final recognition. I have another. We just got another one, so we did. We were recognized by the Southwest Ohio Workforce Investment Board, SWARWIB. Not as catchy, but that is what they call themselves, <laughs> SWARWIB, <laughs> um, for excellence in workforce development. So once again, you know, that combined with our top innovator award, we just have had a lot of excellent recognition. Yeah, and yeah, this, this one is also another fun award. So um, that wraps up my report. And what I'd like to do now is finish up with hopefully it will work. This quick slideshow, I will do a little bit of the talking, as will Dan. So Dan, there you go. Um, just do an update here for the FMP oh, okay. so everybody knows what we have accomplished so far. Dan, hi. Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Okay, yes. perfect. Um, it's hard to follow up on Swarlib. Yes, okay. yes. <laughs> I will do my best. Um, so I'll keep this very brief, but... Um, at Group 4, we've been working with you all since 2019 on the Library Facilities Master Plan. So we just wanted to do a quick refresher about the strategic investments that are being planned for all 41 locations. Uh, we really wanted just to quickly highlight to start that, again, when that FMP process uh, began, what feels like 20 years ago, um, pre-pandemic, that there was a, just a really significant amount of uh, community outreach going to every single branch, um, online, in person, community meetings, focus groups, and surveys, as you can see there, that helped to really craft the plan. The other thing that I just wanted to highlight is as the plan starts to be implemented, and you'll see those individual projects today as well, is that that communication is ongoing. So, both with the public at large as well as stakeholders in person when possible. There's been hybrid, there's been fully virtual, um, as things have ebbed and flowed over the past two years. So if we go to the next yes. slide. Okay. And so we also just wanted to quickly highlight the planning principles. So through an inclusive process uh, with the board in 2019, we actually did uh, quite a few workshops to go from, uh, I think it was over around 40 uh, potential principles. And we really focused on these six principles that are driving the facilities master plan. Um, and they are customer focus, diversity and inclusion, industry-leading excellence, maximizing access, operational sustainability, and transparency. And so then the other quick update that we wanted to provide as well is just what that building program identifies in terms of need. So the 2018 levy funds brings approximately $190 million over 10 years. The facilities master planning process in 2019 
identified $350 million in need. As we all know, there have been really dramatic changes since the FMP, especially within the building industry. And so we just wanted to quickly highlight that there have those, those changes involve things such as the labor market supply chain and cost of materials. Um, I will say just one specific example from the main library project, which we're actually doing in phases in order to really try to take advantage of certain um, market conditions. From when we started designing the, um, the renovated atrium, steel prices have doubled in the past year. And so as we get cost estimates and try to work as designers, we're really having to um, try to stretch dollars as much as possible. But it is a very dynamic uh, market at this point, which really makes it um, just something to keep in mind when you look at these dollars that we really are talking about $2019. But with that said, you all have already done some incredible implementation of the FMP. Just kudos to Molly and Paula, and I will turn it back over. Okay, so you're familiar with these, but we just wanted to do a quick roundup um, to make everyone aware. And again, because of the pandemic and time sort of has lost its real meaning, um, we want to remind everyone where those dollars from the public are going. So Price Hill, that was a $7.3 million investment. We opened that just last April. It seems like longer than that, but we have, we have it up and running. The square footage previously was just over 5,000 usable, and now it's more than 12,000. Fishbeck was our architect, construction manager was Messer. And then we have some key features, most notably those meeting room spaces. We have a couple of study rooms, four meeting rooms in that very large meeting space where we met, I think, in the fall um, with about 100 people can fit in there. So we have, and of course, the parking, and it's fully accessible, which is huge. We also have Deer Park, and I think everyone has visited there. It was a $4.5 million investment. We opened that in December of 2021, so it had two great openings last year. Previously, it was just over 4,000 square foot building. Now it's 25,000 square feet. We work with GBBN. Perkins Carmack was our construction firm. And you can see we also have some key features, again, highlighting fully accessible seven study rooms, two meeting rooms, and then that larger room that can accommodate nearly 200 people. And when we say meeting rooms and study rooms, meeting rooms are like this size, they're slightly larger, and the study rooms are smaller, like maybe three to five people. I can see the staff like, yes, there's a fundamental difference, and people love both of them. Walnut Hills, which we're working on right now, that's a $12.3 million investment. Mm -hmm. We're planning on the grand opening in 2022. They are working out of a small temporary space over there, so we do continue to have a presence in Walnut. But when we open, if you remember, it was just over 10,000 square feet, but it was on two floors and not highly usable space. After we open, it'll be more than 20,000. The architect there was Fishburg. Fishback construction firm was Megan. It will have that theater, a large meeting room, seven small meeting rooms, expanded parking, and once again, fully accessible. Madisonville, that's a $3.3 million investment. The grand opening will be in late 2022. The square footage currently, and they're still in that building operating, is just about 8,600 square feet. It's on two floors. After we open, it will be 8,900 square feet on one floor. GBBN, Megan again is the construction firm. We'll have makerspace uh, equipment there that's flexible and gives people that technology feel. Four study rooms, a large meeting room, and it will be fully accessible. Mm -hmm. Then we have the main library, and Dan and I, Dan is working very closely with us. He's here in town for the fifth time in like as many months, I think. So I just, uh, we had agreed that he would give a little bit of an update on that main library project. Sure, thanks. So group four is supporting Champlin as the architects. Um, on the main library project. We're calling this phase one of the next gen because as we all know, the main library is seven stories, two city blocks, 500,000 square feet. We couldn't quite squeeze all of that into the $24 million <laughs> initial investment. So what we're actually doing, we purposely left the square footage line blank there. Um, we're really renovating the entire south um, building first floor, which is about 45,000 square feet. But even uh, as important as that, the plaza on the south side, just like the north side that's been renovated, as you can see in the image at the top, in terms of inclusivity, accessibility, and transparency, that elevated plaza, all of that is coming down to grade, so that will be completely accessible from um, Vine Street and 9th Street, and will be a new curtain wall that really draws you in, so the atrium is very inwardly focused. You'll be able to see that social stair really from right when you kind of get to the bus stop all the way into the building. And so then we'll have select improvements as well on the second floor and the third floor around the atrium. 
but again, trying to really think of this as the phase one for um, renovating a, a building that really has incredible bones, and sometimes it's actually kind of subtraction of that elevated plaza and allowing people to really understand all the wonderful amenities that you have. Um, that's going to be really exciting. And a range of meeting rooms and study rooms from two people um, all the way up to, I think, you know, a, a few hundred within the atrium itself. There'll be things like a new projector so that you can really, um, and amplified sound, so you can use that atrium for um, different events. So. Thanks, Dan. Mm -hmm. I do want to note, because people love the book fountain structure that was on the plaza and they've asked where is it it's in there it's in there in the corner um, it will be reinstalled we're taking careful um, attention to make sure that we're able to reconstruct it and uh, we also have the blink um, Jen Lewin who was in blink in 2017 will be adding to that public art so it will be a great cool space but we do want to make sure that sometimes people look at the renderings and they're like well didn't you keep that book it's a book um, uh, sculpture now um, and so we'll still be there you can't see it but honestly that is our intention it's right next to the front door yeah it's right, right exactly oh, so you yeah. will see it <laughs> yes. Right there. yes it's and actually you'll actually see it from the inside too it's yes. kind of like we want it to be highly visible yes uh, yes it's actually we're planning to be where the front door is right now because we're moving exactly. the front door yes. so um, quickly near-term projects here we've talked about several of them also wanted to know green township which is getting a, an investment that is not entirely dissimilar from what we see at Anderson so it's kind of a mid-level investment and then we see we'll be in design on a number of projects well, we will talk about a few of those um, a little bit more in our facilities uh, about the process and the plan to move forward on those but some of them we've already talked about specifically paying attention to ongoing maintenance of Avondale, Coryville, and Pleasant Ridge they require additional maintenance they are all uh, buildings that are older I think they're all they're all at least 85, 90, some of them at this point maybe 100. I'm trying to remember. So, you know, it's just a, a reminder that that maintenance, we don't want to get behind on the maintenance again. So when we talk about those dollars that we're looking at and the real needs, some of that is part of that as well. And I do just want to remind everyone, we do have a great new brand. Everyone sports it. I'm looking around. Everyone's got their yet lanyard on and all of that good stuff. So our brand beliefs, our libraries are all about bringing these things to life, empathy, enjoyment, community, and connection. So it's about the buildings, but it's also about what we believe and the people in the buildings even more. So I think with that, that ends my presentation. And I think ends my report as well. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to turn the uh, this matter over to the um, FFNC committee. Mr. Olson. The Facilities and Finance and Audit Committee met at Hyde Park Branch on February 8th, 2022. Committee Chair uh, Robert Hendon and Committee Member Nadine Allen were in attendance. Staff members Eva Jane remained. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't get it together either. Uh, I love saying that. <laughs> Took me a while too. <laughs> uh, uh, Paula Bremheger and Molly DePossi were also in, a, in attendance. It is the recommendation of the committee that the board take the following action. Um, the 2022 through 2027 branch replacements and renovations. Design services. So in response to the request for statements of qualifications for design services for the 20 to 22, 2022, 2027 branch replacements and renovations. We received submittals from the following 10 firms. Champlin Architecture, Elevar, Immersion Design, GBBN, HBM, Legat Architects, Levin Porter, Luminal, Moody, Nolan, and SHP. Library leadership along with trustee representative from the FFAC conducted interviews with six of the firms to confirm their capacity to handle multiple projects concurrently. Based on feedback during the interviews and potential additional project, the library has opted to break this project into two separate projects. One will be the Forest Park branch replacement, and the other will be a combination of uh, the West End branch and Sims Township branch renovation with the possible addition of the Hyde Park branch. Some in important experience factors to consider went, rank, went into ranking the firms, and, and those include experience with similar projects, perceived strength of the proposed team, working with the library, working with public bid projects, and knowledge and relationships with local construction market. So uh, the, the committee ranked the top three firms, each set of branches as follows, and authorized the Eva Jane Romain Coombe director to enter into a contract with the firm most qualified. So uh, the Forest Park branch replacement 
uh, ranked in the following order. Uh, number one, SHP. Number two, Immersion. Number three, Elevar. Uh, the West End branch and Sims Township branch renovations with possible addition of the Hyde Park branch. Uh, number one, ranking uh, immer Immersion. Number two, SHP. Number three, Elevar. Um, so uh, CMR selection. The authorize the publication of the bid below the committee to review the statements of qualifications, select the top three firms, interview the top three as part of the second step of the process where proposals for pricing and technical qualifications are submitted and make a final recommendation to the board in April of 2022. I would like to just take a step back uh, regarding the, 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 the 10 organizations that did submit. Uh, they were very well done, and uh, we're thankful for the effort that those uh, organizations, architectural firms, did put in. Um, I was involved in, I was uh, very impressed with the amount of quality and, and, and uh, talent that presented to us. Um, the so we'll move on to the CMR selection. Um, the construction manager at risk evaluation committee will be as follows, Molly DeFossey, uh, coordinator, Greg Olson, trustee, advisor role, Paula brem -Heeker, Jeff Guerin, Matt Mowry, Kristen Payne, and then a representative from the selected architect advisor role um, in both cases. So two representatives from the selected architectures, architecture teams. So the next is the notice of request for qualifications for construction manager at risk. And you do not need to read the whole, um, the whole notice if you don't dog. want to. You can go, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's up to you. If you do, that's fine. But uh, um, I'll just say that we have to follow certain qualifications pursuant to the Ohio Revised Code, the branch replacements and renovations for this project. There'll be multiple phases. Um, well, the library will determine the sole director to award, um, discretion whether to award. Phase one of the project. Um, guaranteed maximum price amendment is attached, and that includes Hyde Park renovation. That budget budget's to be determined, the West End branch. That budget's only a million dollars, and that is a darling branch. Um, I visited it one Friday with Paula, and there were kids coming in after. It was awesome. <laughs> it was kids, and they were in there reading and playing on the, uh, the, you know, the different mod. It was great. I was really touched. Uh, Sims Township branch renovation and parking expansion project budget's $4 million. And that's probably the next biggest branch we have in terms of circulation and, oh, and, yeah. and attendance. Right. Yep. And a new branch to replace an existing branch. And that, uh, that location is still to be determined, and that's going to be in Forest Park, and that's uh, $12 million. Um, so we'll just move on from there. Main library project update, uh, demolition of the South Plaza and Mezzanine. The board approved the, the maximum GMP for the demolition of the South Plaza and Mezzanine at the December 2021 board meeting inclusive of the CMR fee and the CMR contingency equal to or less than $5.2 million with the total project estimate to be at $5.55 million. The actual GMP is $5,184,542. The project budget remains at $5.5 million in order to maintain a conservative owner contingency. The design team is continuing to work on final design for the interior portion of the project. The timeline is as follows. GMP approved June 2022. Construction begins summer of 2022. Construction complete fall of 2023. Uh, confirm the following change orders modified. Uh, the skylight uh, GMP for, for Turner Construction, that, and these have been approved. Uh, um, G Turner Construction GMP change order number two, required addition, additional fire protection, $48,800. Turner Construction, uh, who is a GMP, uh, change order number three, additional fireproofing, $47,100. Below, uh, I'll read to you, is a summary estimate to date of the library project, excluding elevator and skylight, which is now complete. The budget for this project was pre previously set at $24 million. So the interior estimate, fall of 2021, $15,194,240. North Plaza demo, or North Plaza GMP, $1,005,760. Demolition GMP, $5,184,542. Total cost of construction, including all CMR fees and CMR contingency, $21,384,542. We have a budget for furniture and fixtures of $500,000, technology $500,000, public art 215000 
permits, 400,000, design team, to, design team, $2,056,700. All consulting, owner's rep and design fees, $626,000. Additional design estimate, 75,000. Owner contingency, $1,921,540. For a total amount of $27,678,782. Uh, now we'll move on to the Marymount Branch Courtyard Project. The work on the project is progressing and contractor is waiting on the materials for the canopy skylight. Um, we need to confirm the following change orders for the Marymount Branch Courtyard Project that have been approved. Uh, the contractor is Leo J. Brillmeyer, uh, General Trade, uh, change order number one, extend footings required during permitting process, $6,588.45. Leo J. Brillmeyer, General Trade, change order number two, Upcharge for custom color to match existing roof and trim, $1,562.72. On to the Deer Park branch, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is outstanding. We got the, had the bubble wands on that, that opening day. <laughs> Judge was having a blast. <laughs> I'm going to get one for everyone. Great. Yeah, yeah. I that gave it to funny. everybody. You did. You, you walked All out there with at least 10 of them. <laughs> The thank security was keeping an eye on you. Although the branch opened in December, we continue to complete the punch list that were either incomplete or needed modification at the opening. So we need to confirm the following change orders for the Deer Park branch project that have been approved. Perkins Carmack is the is the general con is the contractor. Change order number eight: additional support for interior and facade, five thousand five hundred seventy-eight dollars and eighty-four cents. Perkins Carmack. Uh, change order number nine at kitchenette knee wall power for gaming area $27,158.98 we anticipate additional change orders that should be reported in April of 2022 2022 resources update confirm updated public library fund estimate for 2022 of $44,977,894 as included in the resources reported to the county for 2022 Confirm the modified reported resources to the county for the LSTA grant special revenue fund by $1,000 to a total of $1,000. Um, so now we have to get an authorization to transfer funds. Now authorize the transfer of the budgeted tra transfers of $19 million from the general fund to the building and repair fund during the year as cash flow permits as determined by Chief Financial and Facilities Officer, officer Molly DeFossey. And so at this point, um, do I need to we need to call for ask a motion we have a motion? You can make the motion. I'd like to you ask for move. a motion um, to authorize these transfer of funds. And do you right. want to do the whole report? Yeah, the yeah. Whole. And also, okay, the and whole. ask for a motion to accept all the actions in the report. I'll second that. Now you have to make the motion. I thought you were moving to accept I can make the motion? Yes. All right, I'm making a motion. Okay. <laughs> Second. Sorry. Second. I feel like a rookie here. And I apologize. Paul, are we doing all in favor or roll call? Um, you know I guess do a roll, roll call. call. Yeah. yeah. Ms. Allen? Yes. Mr. Harding? Yes. Ms. Conan? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Ms. Reddy? Yes. Thank you. All right, that concludes that report. Now we'll move. I thought he's got the information. Now he's okay. got the info. Okay. Yeah. No more action. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Oh, all right. Here we are. So you all get to Keep going. Anymore. Yeah, you all got right. it. Sir. There's a little bit more. A little bit more. Um, oh, thank you. There's the one right seat. next to you. We got more. Yeah, I'm no sorry. Four, five, no six, six, the Price seven, Hill Parklet. Seven or eight more. <laughs> I've been singing dance, I guess. On December, on February 10th, 2022, bids for the Price Hill Parklet, the front lawn of the Price Hill Branch, were received. The estimate for the project was. $266,045, and the library received two bids, one at $304,400, the other at $358,000. Both bids were more than 10% over the published estimate, which require the project to be rebid. We will work with the architect to review the bids to update the estimate before rebidding in the next few weeks. We hope to report the results for confirmation at the April 2022 board meeting. Madisonville branch. The board approved the, the maximum GMP for the Madison Madisonville branch lease built out at the December 2021 board meeting, inclusive of CMR fee and CMR contingency equal to or less than $2.3 million with the project estimate of $3.3 million. The actual GMP is $2,047,411 and the project budget remains at $3.3 million in order to maintain a conservative owner contingency. We expect constru construction 
to begin in February. Megan is mobilizing the site. Megan Construction is mobilizing the site and waiting on the permit. Hyde Park planning. The facility master plan includes a renovation maintenance project for the Hyde Park branch, which includes an elevator replacement and branch refresh. An adjacent parcel was recently sold and there are plans to redevelop the property. In order to complete the project, the developer will need access to, will need to access a main sewer line that runs under that library's lot. So the developer has suggested that they will pay the necessary costs to access the sewer line and make other improvements uh, to our lot to, redu to reduce the current drainage issues and, in and increase the number of parking spots that we have. Uh, considering this opportunity along with the $513,000 donation the library received in 2018 uh, to be used for Hyde Park, we are evaluating the possibility of adding this project to our schedule of work, mm -hmm. which we talked about earlier in the, in the award process. Uh, Walnut Hills Branch Accessibility. The brick is being installed on the exterior. The interior work is ongoing. The project remains on schedule. Mm -hmm. Price Hill Branch Accessibility. We are still working on the final closeout documentation and a few remaining punch items. As previously reported, the library has been named in a claim filed by Imbus Roofing, Roofing on Jostin Construction. Recently, this claim has been stayed due to agreed upon arbitration by the two parties. The Hamilton County Prosecutor's Office continues to monitor the case on behalf of the library. Energy Retrofit Project. We are still working on the final closeout documentation with Geiler Company. Mm -hmm. As noted in last several board reports, the Geiler Company has filed a claim against the library stating that the work performed was greater than the contracted scope. The Hamilton County Prosecutor's Attorney's Office is representing the library in this matter. Forest Park Branch Property Exchange. The Prosecutor's Office has drafted the property exchange agreement based on the letter of intent that was approved at the December 14, 2021 board meeting. We have sent the agreement to the City of Forest Park for their review. We are working to have a detail, we are working to have the details ironed out by the April 2020, uh, 2022 board meeting. Mr. Olson, just a quick update, yes. sorry. Um, I just wanted to note that Molly and I did talk with uh, Don Jones, who's the city manager at Forest Park just today, and he has sent back some agreements. So that is progressing. We are in progress on that. We are working. Well, congratulations. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's good. yeah. That's so good we're hoping to wrap that up real soon, and, and Don is really excited. And that was my question. I just wanted to know how yeah. it was going, yeah. coming yeah. along. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so they're very excited, and Paul Brem, who's the economic development person over there, and, and Don have both been working closely with us, so kudos to them for keeping that moving along with us. That's great. Library project participation. The library seeks to be inclusive on all of our projects. Several of our current and recent partners are MBE or WBE certified. Turner Construction, one of the largest current project partners, reports to the library with project participation. The charts below are... Oh, they're up there on the screen, good. The chart, the projects are on the screen, are samples of the information provided. We will work with our newly hired diversity, equity, inclusion, and culture officer, who we heard from earlier, to continue to seek opportunities to expand our efforts in providing opportunities for all to take part in library projects, as well as providing services and supplies in ongoing operations. We will also continue to enhance reporting mechanisms to document our efforts and improvements in this important area. Ele elevator project, uh, percent inclusion by volume. Uh, looks like SBE was 3% and WB 4% with a total percentage of seven. Skylight project inclusion by volume, um, 14%. Uh, WBE 10%, SBE 4%. 2021 year end summary. The table below represents the final 2021 available fund balances as were reported to the county in January of 2022. The variances from the December 2020, 2021 report are the result of overall favorable actual activity as compared to the estimates. So the um, 2022 estimated available balance in the general fund, $23,750,000. The 2022 estimated resources are $84,464,000 with a total appropriation for 2022 of $85,680,500. Mm -hmm. Building and Repair Capital Fund, 2022 estimated available balance, $25,336,358.65. 2022 estimated resources, 19 million. 2022 appropriation, $42,250,000. Special Revenue, four funds. 
Um, estimated available balance for 2022, $1,225,141.42. Estimated resources for 2022, $573,402.84. The 2022 appropriation is $643,707.68. We have 44 permanent funds. That is 2022 estimated available balance of $1,374,685.65. 2022 estimated resources of $153,250. The 2022 appropriation is $299,000. Bless you, $500. For a total of my goodness, it's on a different page. Um, <laughs> right. Keep it on your toes, Mr. Mm -hmm. I see how this works. Toes. The 2022 <laughs> estimate, you think I'd have it memorized by now. <laughs> Look at this. The 2022 <laughs> estimated, Brett, you're always coming through. There you go. The estimated, they left me, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, mm-hmm. 2022 estimated available balance <laughs> of $51,686,185.72. The 2022 estimated resources are $104,190,652.84, and the 2022 appropriation is $128,873,707.68. Okay, I'm almost out of gas. Yeah. Holy smokes. Thank you. Accounting system. The library has been using Central Square One solution since 2013. The system is performing at a basic level and does not allow us the opportunity to make the best use of our resources. We are currently seeking a system that will reduce manual work, eliminate redundancies, capitalize on current technology, and increase transparency both internally and externally. We have done a preliminary review of several systems and reached out to peers. The library will be implementing Tyler Technologies Munis solution during 2022. The implementation process will begin in March and go live date is one is January 1st, 2023. And that is the end of the FFAC Thank report. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> All done. Thanks. All right. Mm -hmm. You're turning it back over to, uh, I'll turn back over to myself. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to be giving the Human Resources Committee report. I'm the chair of that. Um, we met on February the 8th, 2022. Committee chair, myself, and uh, committee member Christopher A. Harding were in attendance, along with committee member Diane Cunningham Redding, who was in virtual attendance. Staff members Paula Bremheger, Kyla Hardin, Michelle Matthews, and Ashley Dees were also in attendance. It is a recommendation of the committee that the board accept the following recommendation. Pay administration policy. As part of our investing and staff initiative, new pay administration guidelines were developed to align with the best practices as recommended by our compensation consultant, Siegel Group. To reflect these changes, it is recommended that our current wage and salary policy be replaced with the pay administration policy shown in Exhibit 1. Our current pay and salary policy is shown in Exhibit 2. Um, I would like to move that we accept, adopt this policy. I'll make a I move myself. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Seconded. Move and second. Is there any discussion? No. Okay. Uh, Ms. Allen? Yes. Mr. Harding? Yes. Ms. Conan? Yes. Mr. Olson? Yes. Ms. Redden? Yes. Okay, and we have several for information only um, reports to make about diversity, equity, and inclusion. As part of our work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have received a final report of the Comprehensive Racial Equity Assessment and Diagnostic Read that was conducted by Jen Ingram, our DEI consultant and owner of Calibrated Lenses. Jen joined the HR committee meeting to share highlights of the executive summary in Exhibit 3. All these exhibits are attached to, are attached. Um, and recommendations around continuing to embed, that's a good word, to embed DEI into the work of the library. We are looking forward to Dr. Dees, who is here today, our new diversity, equity, inclusion, and culture director, using this assessment to help guide her leadership and priorities in our DEI work moving forward as well. <clears throat> HR manager honored as service person of the year. We are excited to share that human resources manager, Michelle Matthews, she's here, isn't she? She's not here. I didn't think I saw her, okay. She, she couldn't make it. She must be ill. Okay. Oh, 
Okay. She was at the committee meeting. She right? was at the yeah. committee so meeting. The <laughs> She's watching. Does she? Okay. She didn't. Def- no, we already. We already gave her the award, and she already. We, we, she was present. She was present at our committee meeting, and she has been selected by the National Customer Service Association. That's a national, another one of our national awards, yeah. as the winner of the 2022 All Star Award for Service Person of the Year. Uh, Michelle was nominated for her tremendous work in supporting our staff through the COVID-19 pandemic. Michelle has taken hundreds of calls, morning, nights, weekends, and holidays, almost like Paula Brim Heger here, <laughs> from. St- <laughs> Yeah, poor Michelle, though, that's what, it was all COVID. Oh, okay, all, all COVID. All the time. <laughs> from COVID, she, from staff, yeah. around concerns related to the pandemic. She not only shows care and compassion to those who have been directly impacted by the virus, but then engages in contract tracing and meets with groups of staff to address any questions or concerns. Michelle has worked tirelessly with staff in these difficult times, and her steady and measured approach has been consistently appreciated and recognized across the system. So congratulations on this well-deserved award, Michelle, if you're listening. Yay, Michelle. (laughs) Professional membership dues. In January 2020, in alignment with our Investing in Staff initiative, the library began offering financial assistance for Ohio library membership dues. We will now also be offering financial assistance for membership dues of other local and state professional organizations to staff who are not in a library-specific role, like in the technology, marketing, human resources, finance and facilities, et cetera, and where OLC may not have as robust growth or networking opportunities as other local organizations. So staff will have the option to request financial assistance for organizations that are pertinent to their current role and will follow the same guidelines as those that have been established for OLC membership dues. I'm sure this is lifting the morale of the staff. Again, thank you for that. It is in response to a direct staff feedback. I'm looking at Kyla, we received that. Thank you, Kyla Harden, who's here, director. Yeah. Exhibit one, uh, proposed pay administration policy. We already, uh, we've already accepted that. Also exhibit two. The other thing that is attached is the actual calibrated calibrated lens report called READ. Um, are we going to read this? Um, it's the executive summary, so it's available for folks. In there it, is an executive it, summary. Yeah. It's a very good read. Yeah. I mean, it's very well written. It's not boring at all. It's very interesting. So I, I hope that you take the time to read this report and to be aware of what we're going to be doing uh, and how the library has embraced this concept and, and, and has embedded it in our policy. So I think that, is there one last sentence here? No, I think, you're, I think I've concluded my report with that. And now I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Redden, Operations Committee Chair for the Operations Report. Thank you, George Allen, Mr. Vice President. So this is Operation Items, um, report prepared by Brent Bonfield. Thank you very much. Deer Park Branch update. The newly renovated Deer Park Branch officially o- opened officially on December 10, 2021, and its first two months, it's been a great success. In December 2021 and January 2022, Deer Park had more customer visits than any other CHPL branch library, with increases of 151% and 145% year over year. In addition, circulation of books, movies, magazines, and other materials increased year over year by over 66%. PC use increased by 197%, Wi-Fi use increased over 500%, mm. and there were over 200 customer bookings for the branch's seven meeting and study rooms in January. Mm. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's busy. crazy. Yeah. It beats even Sims. If you build it, they yes. will come. I yeah. Mean, that's wow. incredible. Yes. So I'm on, like, Deer Park Moms on Facebook, and they talk about it almost mm-hmm. every mm-hmm. single day. Somebody. Did you know they have that? Do you know they have that? Do you, a neighbor who I didn't even know went to Deer mm. Park Branch when well, they were there in the ribbon cutting, they take out um, puzzles. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like, who would have even thought puzzles? Yeah. That's a Did great you, idea. Do you, you belong to the moms of that branch? or is Deer Park. Some, the, the Deer Park? Yeah. Yes, Deer Park it? Moms. Deer Park Moms. Okay. Yeah. Have you seen so a similar cool. yeah. increase at, at Price Hill Lake? Uh, we we, ha- I would think. We have, we have seen... Uh, 
increases at Price Hill, but we think that the pandemic had a little bit higher impact on Price Hill because we opened it and okay. then it was open for a little bit and, and then quickly the pandemic sort of swooped back in. Um, so we continue to look at that one. I, I know Brett and I talked about that and we do see um, bookings for the meeting space is he that is heavily used okay. there. Um, but we uh, were just talking about that. Beth and I were talking about how to market that and make sure people are aware. Because Price Hill, if you remember, you know, Deer Park had that great thing. We closed the doors one place and then we opened okay. the doors right down the street. Mm -hmm. Price Hill, because of the facility issue, we yeah. had the small pop-up library in the Cincinnati Recreation mm -hmm. Center. But really, that was the presence for some time. And then we had to close that one because we, and we were closed in the community yeah. for a little bit due to the fact that the CRC needed the space and we were moving out. So there was more disruption of service in Price Hill. So we have seen the communities embraced it, but the Deer Park seamlessness is what I think has created this environment where people just walk down the street and, and there right it is. And it's right behind the here. school. Exactly. And the parking right lot's enormous. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We have no parking yes. issues. Yeah, there's no parking issues. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Yes, yeah, really. it is. Yeah. And, and it's on Main Street. It's on, it's down on the Main road. Street. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. And we're open on Sundays. Yes, it's That's true. a big deal. Yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. yeah. That's a big deal. That's all right. Um, OCRC claim the library was notified that we are a respondent in Adam Conway versus Harrison Public Library. The case involves an incident that occurred in the Harrison Branch Library. The library worked with the Hamilton County Prosecuting Attorney's Office in filing a response. And that is my report, Madam. Thank, thank you for your report. And so I'll turn the matter over now to Mr. Harding, Strategy Committee Chair, for the strategy report. Well, uh, first, thanks to uh, Beth Yoke, our Chief Strategy Officer, uh, for putting this together. Um, starting off uh, in supporting our community's well-being, uh, we've we have distributed about 4,000 at-home COVID-19 test kits so far in the new year. Uh, the state prioritized supplying kits to our K-12 through schools and universities during the Omicron surge, so we have not had test kits to distribute for about a month. As tests become available again, we expect to receive a limited number. In partnership with the Hamilton County Developmental Disability Services, select branch libraries will feature displays of materials from HCDDS to promote March as Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. The Deer Park branch is also piloting a monthly virtual reading and discussion group for residents of HCDDS. We are participating with the Council on Aging to offer a senior and caregiver support networker, network. Uh, our partnership will continue in the summer of 2022 with a series of health and well-being workshops for caregivers in collaboration with the council and UC Health. As part of our Get Covered Ohio initiative, several community groups have reached out to the library seeking to partner with us to help community members sign up for Medicare and healthcare plans. We anticipate adopting the model we use for free tax assistance to begin providing the service at some of our locations. Mr. Harding, just a quick point of privilege, I do want to point out the test kits right after we published this. We got test kits on Saturday. Denise can verify that. They went pretty quickly, not as quickly as they had. So uh, as they had been, they were still in high demand. So we are now in excess of that 4,000 right. already. So just already. To, to make that note. Ticket. Well, and I know if anybody's still, yeah. 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 We would need a rolling ticket. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And I imagine if we're still struggling, I mean, I know the federal government's yeah. given out kits. So if people are still looking for those, uh, you can apply for that. Yes. Um, but moving onward to mm -hmm. um, supporting uh, entrepreneurs, job seekers, and workforce development. Uh, in partnership with the Talbert House, we began a series of hands-on tech education workshops at the main library for veterans experiencing homelessness who are seeking jobs. We have also developed a series of food business startups workshops in collaboration with Finley Kitchen and partners such as the African American Chamber of Commerce, Cincinnati Compass, the Latina Entrepreneur Academy, and the Cincinnati uh, Metro Enterprise Initiative. The six-part series features graduates of the Finley Kitchen Small Business Startup Program. Uh, resources for college training and certification programs are being ramped up to support the state of Ohio's workforce readiness efforts. Last month, Chief, Chief Strategy Officer Beth Yoke participated in the Ohio Library Council's webinar to explore how libraries could help more families complete the free application for federal student aid, mm. which is amazing being a, a recent college grad myself. Uh, <laughs> I think that's great help. Um, a college and career readiness 
page has also uh, been added to the library's website. Uh, planning is in the works for providing additional support to the community on this important topic and a youth services staff member from each location is currently participating in training. Uh, moving on to civic engagement, we are participating in the Greater Cincinnati Voter Collaborative's 2022 effort to encourage voting in the 2022 elections, targeting the precincts with the lowest voter registration and voter turnout from past election cycles. With customer engagement, we are planning to host a community information session in March in Madisonville to share the final branch design. We will also be planning community sessions for the West End renovation, as well as organizing community engagement around the public arts installation coming to the main library. Recent community sessions held for Forest Park and the main library are posted on the building, the Next Generation Library. Uh, with our government relations efforts, our Ava Jane Romaine Coom Director, Paula Brem Heger, and Government Relations Coordinator Elaine Fay attended the legislative reception held by the Cincinnati Chamber of Commerce on December 16th. Paula and Elaine took this opportunity to introduce themselves to the newly elected Cincinnati City Council members and talk to them briefly about some of the ways the library supports the community. And uh, just some programming to note, the Winter Checkout Challenge runs from January 18th to February 25th of 2022. Customers 18 plus can visit the library in person or go online to participate. Uh, so far we've had 3,000 customers who have participated online and hundreds more who have participated in branches. Uh, the library's 2022 writer in residence is Paulette Hansel, hopefully I've said that right, uh, who comes to us with a distinguished background in poetry and memoir and who has extensive experience teaching writing to others. Paulette's first workshop, Writing Our Lives, was held virtually on Janu January 28th. This effort is funded by the Library Foundation. Uh, just a few more additional events. Uh, on February 15th, we'll have a chocolate tasting event for teens at the main library. Uh, we'll have a what virtual drawing there? club for kids January <laughs> through February of 22. Uh, a virtual podcast club uh, February 14th and March 14th. Oh, wow. um, a virtual drawing birds in Charlie Harper style uh, February 17th. Uh, the African American Read In is a series of events taking place throughout the county in February, hosted by the library's Black Events and Exhibits Committee, and uh, with Black History of the uh, Black History of Glendale discussion series, uh, which is beginning, which began February 14th. Uh, other dates, the 21st and the 28th, being held at Forest Park. Um, discussing our marketing efforts, we have completed the transition to a new platform for engaging customers via email. It allows us to better track and target customer engagement and sends messaging directly related to what they click on or visit on the website. In the near future, we'll also have the ability to customize uh, customer notices. We've, we are working with data analysts and the ILS team to set up a new tool called Gale Analytics, which will give us more detailed information about demographics and consumer profiles of both customers and residents who are not yet customers. Uh, later this month, a survey will go out to customers who have a library card but have not used them in the last two years. We hope to regain insight into why customers stop using our services and what we can do to get them back. Uh, strategic planning, as we track to begin the process in the second quarter of 2022 and complete it by the end of the third quarter, uh, robust staff and community engagement will inform the process and will leverage the successful practices developed during the creation of the Facility Master's Plan. Uh, scope of work and timeline are currently being finalized. We anticipate engaging a consultant with a strong track record of success with st strategic planning, as well as a, uh, leveraging, leveraging a local organization to assist with the focus groups that will help us engage with underserved parts of the community. This new plan will focus on and guide the work of the library over the next several years and incorporates other key initiatives such as our diversity, equity, and inclusion work and our facility master plan implementation. And with that, I conclude my report. Thank you, Mr. Harding. I'm gonna turn this things over to Mr. Olson, our technology committee chair. Thanks, Nikki. Yeah. This is from uh, Holbrook Sample, the chief technology and logistics officer for the library. Uh, staffing at Maine, a cross-departmental model was developed during the pandemic to provide reference service because of the effectiveness of this model and also because of genealogy, local history and reference often experience overlap in serving users. This reference model will continue during the temporary closure of the South Building. 
These services will be based in the genealogy and local history department, GLH, at the, at the main library. Services under GLH umbrella will include coordination of reference services, local history, genealogy, digital services, and the fifth, uh, special collections. This requires the support of several additional staff. Two Master of Library and Information Sciences positions were, were, were created in the Virtual Information Center during the early part of the pandemic to handle the increased number of calls in virtual context will be moving into the GLH department. The MLIS position in the former Information and Reference Department, which focuses on grants, will be moving into the GLH department as well. The creation of a GLH reference coordinator, which will support the cross-departmental reference team oversight and access to special collections and an anticipated focus on our collections of art materials will be achieved by the creation of a GLH mm. art and special collections position. These changes should be seen as a two-year bridge that will help lay the foundation for a robust and long-term staffing model that will have in place that we will have in place when the renovations of the south building are complete. Additionally, two positions will be created in the sorting and materials retrieval department to help streamline processes connected to our main library collection. And, and Mr. Olson, just to give yes. a little bit of context, these positions are new, but the resources are existing. These are not additional resources dedicated. They're changing resources around. And I'm looking at Holbrook, who oversees that um, sorting and material retrieval, which is the f first along the logistic line of getting your stuff in your hands. And those positions exist they're currently open they're being slightly changed to do some of this work so that's an example of that uh, just to keep in mind when we talk about this these are not a bunch of new resources we're dedicating their redistribution of existing resources to get us ready for you know a future forward look at what's going on just for clarification well have you done Thank your you. genealogy re uh, since you're there I know. have you well <laughs> how many have any of you done use the genealogy history services to find mm -hmm. out about your yeah. family tree yeah interesting do i yes yes with march coming up i always claim a lot of irish heritage but it's you know i don't like to show the paperwork i know i know like, what'd you yeah, say yeah. everyone is oh yeah, yeah. Right. I, I, I have my hat yeah exactly i think it's allowed all right so thank you for that report i'm going to turn things over now to mrs cohen for our development committee thank report you, so the Development Committee is uh, making a report prepared by Stacy Denison, Chief Development Officer. Thank you, Stacy. This is always a fun report. <laughs> um, I like it. Um, so the library has been the grateful recipient of several gifts since December, including two sizable bequest distributions from the Allen Beach Trust and the Shirley E. Long for Hyde Park, as well as contributions from Richard H. Jones and the Bruce Family Charitable Foundation for Marymount. The Library Foundation uh, has also been the grateful recipient of several significant grants and gifts. Uh, Tom Jones for the North Plaza at Maine, Paul and Betsy Sittenfeld for the new named endowment fund, Helen H. and John A. Anderson in part for Forest Park, David N. and Ann Early Foundation for Marymount, the Johnson Foundation for Workforce Development, Bruce G. Stewart, the Berger Abernathy Charitable Fund, Janet and Paul Sullivan, Dr. Rochelle Bruno and Stephen Bondurant, the David and Marianne Foster Fund, an anonymous donor, and Sally uh, Mack and J. Tracy Schreiber, Schreiber, excuse me. Additionally, the Ed and Joanne Hubert Found Family Foundation and the Wolgamuth Hershity Foundation made gifts to support Discover Summer. Several additional applications for funding have been submitted and are being reviewed. And Stacy, we have our fingers crossed. Um, the fall, Foundation's fall campaign was a success with 31% more donations received over yes. 2020, which yes. is really amazing. That, that is. Um, and finally, the Anderson Township Library Association will host a donate day at the Anderson branch from 9 to 12 on April 30th in preparation for the June sale. And the June sale will be held at the Nagel Middle School June 24th to 26th. Thanks in advance for that one. All right, that we will now my meet. Report. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Okay.
And we now need a motion and a voice vote for approval of the consent items. I move that we uh, adopt and accept and approve the consent items. Second. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'm going to move for adjournment with a voice vote to approve that. Is there a second? second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.